Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between two of my favorite people, Jennifer Sr. and Heidi Stevens. Thanks for joining us. FAN celebrates its 40th anniversary this year, and we're honored to have the robust support of dozens of schools, nonprofits, corporations, families, and individuals from across the country. We're committed to our vision of an informed and compassionate community, and we'll achieve that vision by presenting fresh ideas that elevate minds, expand hearts, and make the world a better place. We have hundreds of videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Jen Sr. is a staff writer at The Atlantic and winner of the 2022 Pulitzer for Feature Writing. Yay! Prior to joining The Atlantic, she spent five years at The New York Times, first as one of its daily, three daily book critics, then as a columnist for the opinion page. Before that, she spent 18 years as a staff writer for New York Magazine, writing profiles and cover stories about politics, social science, and mental health. Her book, All Joy and No Fun, yeah, All Joy and No Fun, sorry, The Paradox of Modern Parenthood, spent eight weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was named one of Slate's top 10 books of 2014. That's when we first met Jen back in 2014. She'll be joined on the screen by Heidi Stevens, who is a Chicago-based writer and the Director of External Affairs for the University of Chicago's TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health, which works to provide parents, caregivers, and communities the knowledge and tools to optimize foundational brain development in all children. Prior to joining the University of Chicago, Stevens worked, we'll call her Heidi, Heidi worked at the Chicago Tribune for 23 years, where she wrote a daily column called Balancing Act, she was awarded the Ann Keegan Award for Distinguished Journalism in 2018, and she writes a weekly national syndicated column. She has served also on the FAN Board of Directors since September 2021. And now let's welcome Jen Sr. and Heidi Stevens. Thanks, Lonnie. Thank you, Lonnie. And thank you to FAN. This is a treasure, this, this organization, this institution. And I said, I've said before, I feel like it should be cloned, but I also don't because I then it would water down like the incredible awesomeness and potency of this particular, you know, outpost of uh, whatever. Thought, you know, ideas, thought. conversation, dialogue. Yeah, ideas, right, exactly, discourse, you know, it's just amazing. Discourse. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And actually, fan brought me to you. I was a huge fan of All Joy and No Fun, but I don't know that I would have met you if I didn't get to come interview you when you were in town for fan. Um, and then, of course, just grew more and more and more uh, in love with your your writing and your ideas ever since. So um, this is really an honor. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I've adored your work for forever. And I'm a big fan. I was a big fan of your column. Anyway, now you've branched out and you're doing like, you know, you've got many different plates in the air, which is yeah. exciting. Yeah. Well, we'll fangirl later. Uh, <laughs> for uh, for now, let's talk about um, the start, because I think there are probably some people in the audience who haven't had a chance to read the book um, or the original article that, um, you know, the book is a, branches off from um, or, or, or read it, you know, when it came out, which has been a little while. So maybe if you could start by, Describing the story that's really, you know, centering um, and and setting the scene for this discussion tonight about grief and and love. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there are two kind of tent poles to discuss. So the basic premise is this: my brother's roommate of eight years, four in college and then four in New York when they were broke young men. Um, died on September 11th. He woke up that morning, went to work and never came home. Um, and so one aspect of this story, which is now a standalone book, as you said, um, one aspect of it was me looking at the ways that everybody around him grieved, particularly his parents. Mm -hmm. And I thought on some level, this is a story about a marriage because I have never seen two people grieve more differently than the McElveins. Bobby McElvain was his name, the boy, my brother's roommate, who I knew and loved, I adored him. Bob Sr. Is his, father, is his father and Helen is his mother. And Bob Sr. went down this kind of rabbit hole, decided that 9-11 was an inside job and that the government did it. Mm -hmm. Very unusual reaction. Mm -hmm. Helen couldn't care less about the origins of 9-11 didn't want to talk about 9-11, really stuffed her grief down, 
Mm -hmm. Whereas Bob Sr. wanted to talk about it all the time. So starting right there, you've got to a couple who is contending with the unimaginable, the intolerable, the worst thing possible in two very different ways. Yeah. The second thing this was about was Bobby was this kind of miracle of self-invention. He was charming and irrepressible and highly vectored. It, like it was as if he sort of entered the world as if yanked from a slingshot. You know, he just kind of landed here. Um, and he- uh, a great visual. Uh, yeah, but if you met him, <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's not that remote a metaphor. You're just like, whoa, what? You know, I mean, he's really, he was something. And, um, and like all self-invented people, he just had a lot of energy and a lot going on. He wanted to be a novelist. Uh, at Princeton, he took a class with Toni Morrison, which was a competitive thing. And she remembered him so well that when he died, um, his parents got not one, but two condolence notes from her. One containing a paper, like just that she, he'd written saying, this kid, he was so smart, he was so insightful. And Bobby, in his heart, he wanted to be a writer and he went into publishing briefly, but if you are a middle-class kid from Philadelphia, whose parents are special ed teachers, which the McElveins were, and his dad owned a bar for a while, mm -hmm. publishing pays not, right? So. He then quickly went into corporate PR, but he kept these diaries and these like novels and these shards of novels and scribbles. Legal pads. Legal pads, exactly. Yeah, you remember, yes, right, yeah. So uh, one of his diaries, the last diary he ever wrote went missing. It didn't go missing. I should be clear about this actually. It was on his desk when he died. And that horrible day when they got confirmation that he had died and they were lucky to even get confirmation they had a body unlike most families it was we can discuss that later but what happened was his diary was sitting on his desk and his father kind of brokenly wanders upstairs to my brother's apartment to empty out his things and his diary is there and my brother is there another friend is there and bobby's Let's call her fiance. She wasn't quite his fiance, but he had right. bought them. She's there and she opens this diary, sees that her name is everywhere in it and says, may I have this? Mm -hmm. His father says, of course. Mm -hmm. When he boxes up all of Bobby's things and goes downstairs and tells his wife this, she loses it mm -hmm. and says, how could you do that? How could you give away the last thing our son ever wrote yeah this was a chance the last thoughts in his brain exactly on those pages mm -hmm. exactly the last thoughts that's right it could for all we know it was dated september 10th like we don't even know but yeah. it was a chance to be in the company of our son one last time hearing fresh thoughts fresh conversation um and mature conversation because they had old diaries of his but from when he was a kid you know so she was so upset and remained upset basically for 15 years, let's say out of the 20, um, which is when I wrote the story. And she begged Jen to get this diary back and Jen wouldn't give it back. So the Jen was the fiance. I'm sorry? Jen was the fiance. Sorry, yes. Oh, sorry, my bad, yes. So the other part of my story, in addition to looking at how everybody grieved, right, Jen, his parents, very different, his brother, younger brother. In yeah. addition to looking at the four different trajectories of grief, because no one grieved in the same way. I also wanted to see what, this diary had like a totemic kind of significance. Yeah. What was in there and what would drive a person to keep it? What would drive this argument? What is the importance of these memories and these artifacts and these tangible things that, you know, that, that, that we um, cherish and cling to and that sort of assume outsized importance when someone is gone. Mm -hmm. So examining that. And also it just so happened that what was in that diary was like goose pimplingly germane yeah. to the situation at hand. That there yeah. was, was just unbelievable. So. so could you walk us through the timeline of you learning about the diary um, and, and and writing the story. How how long did you spend with the family? At what point did you decide this is a story that that people need to read? 
Um, can you walk us through that timeline? Yes. And in fact, you were the first person to ask me about the timeline of the diary. Um, it's like such a good question. So I learned, Jen walked off with the diary probably on September 13th or 14th, whenever they boxed up Bobby's stuff, probably the 13th. Yeah. And that night, people gathered in my parents' apartment, which was very close to my brother's apartment. Um, and I got to know the McElveins much better then. They were so upset that they had just come from the morgue and Bob Sr. could barely hold it together. They, they wouldn't, they really discouraged him from looking at Bobby's body. Mm -hmm. And all he said to me, as I opened the door, I opened the door, my mother and father were like busy putting out food. And my brother was, I think with Jeff, his, you know, Bobby's brother, mm -hmm. I opened the door and Bob Sr. looked at me and said, they wouldn't let me see my boy, mm -hmm. his head. Cause he, he was missing most of it. Yeah. He just started to cry. You're going to form a bond with those people for the rest of your life when you have a moment with them like that. And that was like one of the most intimate moments I've ever spent with another human being. I knew them previously because I'd seen them at events, you know, different holidays, different school functions for my brother, but this was unforgettable. And I became very close kind of not very close, I became closer to the family because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. At some point when I saw Helen, maybe a month, two, three later, a year later, I don't know, she mentioned this diary and she was hopping mad. Okay. And she got me hopping mad. Yeah. How dare this woman walk off with this diary, not even give it back. Helen had even said to her, look, I understand that you want to keep it. I just want the words. Like if Bobby yeah. is- Xerox person, it for me. Yeah, Xerox it, right. And and redact anything that's about you. It doesn't have yeah. to be, if he's talking about a tree, just send me the parts about the tree. Yeah. And she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't. I found mm -hmm. this mystifying. And I, I, I turned her into a villain, even though I, I knew her to be like a lovely person, but I just, she was dead to me, right? Like mm -hmm. suddenly I, I just it recapped who she was to me. And I would have these fantasies like Helen every time I saw Helen. I mean, I would have these fantasies about MacGyvering my way into her, Jen's apartment and stealing it and liberating it and getting it back and being able to go, voila, ta-da, I've got it for you. I mean, I, something to give Helen closure, not that, I mean, we can have a whole other conversation because it's something I address. Is there even such a thing as closure? Right. Does a diary give you closure? I don't know, but I had a fantasy about this. Mm -hmm. When I discussed this with my bosses at the Atlantic, it was like my third day of work. They asked me if I knew anybody who had died on September 11th because they were doing an anniversary kind of package about it. And they already had like George Packer and David Frum doing the big think, thinking about, um, you know, how the, the how what foreign policy had been reshaped in the aftermath, but they didn't- 20 know. years later. This later. conversation's happening 20 years later, 20 year anniversary of- Your anniversary issue, but they wanted to know, did you know anybody who actually died, who was directly affected by this? And I said, yes. Okay. I and I thought I would be writing about the McElveen's marriage. I thought I would never get this diary back. Jen had vanished. I, I couldn't imagine finding her. I didn't know how I'd find her. Um, and she had a very light online footprint. And I didn't even know how to explain it to my new boss, this crazy tale about a lost diary. It just, it wasn't something I could condense into an elevator pitch. But if you've ever, have you ever listened, just by any weird chance, have you ever listened to the podcast, Heavyweight? No. Okay, it's the greatest I? podcast ever. Okay, and yes. All journalism should be mod like modeled on it. Mm -hmm. So it's this guy who is basically in the closure business where he, you know, some 45 year old woman will call him up and say, a bunch of eighth graders dumped me when I was, uh, you know, whatever, when I was 13. Yeah. And I've been thinking about this yeah. and obsessing and perseverating. And I don't know what I did. Can you track them all down and find out what I did? Wow. It's like his job, right? So like, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. I'm going to find this diary. Like I'm going to 20 years later, get this diary and it's going to be like an episode of heavyweight. And then you did. And then I did. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. found her and she still had the diary. It was in a trunk, right? 
was in a trunk and I was so terrified. I mean, I wrote her this note, not saying, hey, I want this diary, but saying truthfully that I wanted to write a 20 year anniversary story and see how, how everybody had sort of swept in this enormous kind of event, this national event that to them had been very personal and how they metabolized their grief and it was gonna be different for each of them. And I knew it was very painful. Would she be willing to chat with me? And she wrote me back the warmest, it made me feel terrible because I had cast her as this ogre, right? Yeah. But um, I said, yeah, sure. Like, I, 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 I mean, I wrote her back and I said, would you do this? She was like, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And then she said, in fact, I have such warm memories of sitting with you in you know, your parents' apartment mm -hmm talking about this mm. um and you know I'm and sorry. she was grieving even before bobby died because her mother had just she had just lost her mother right so that was this was grief on top of grief for her grief on top of grief and she was young she lost her mother at 26 right and yeah. then she loses like and, and also her, and her father was not um he was a very narrowly rational man he was not mm. somebody that she was close to so she was already feeling really bereft. And then suddenly the man with whom she was, she was great. She was mourning her past, her mother and her future. Her That's fiance, right. right? That's she was from both directions. She was mourning. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Talk for a minute about grief as a mountain, um, because I think that's such a powerful analogy to explain how, individual and isolating grief can be, even if you're grieving alongside someone else. And, and in, in their case, in the parents' case, the grieving someone that, I mean, they loved, they, I'm sure they loved their son equally, um, but they grieve very differently. So talk, talk about that mountain analogy. Yeah, no, no, thank you for asking that, right? So, okay, so when Bobby died, the McIlvain saw a grief counselor. They saw many, because if you remember after September 11th, in New York, you were, I don't know if you were, you were probably in Chicago, but- I was. Um, yeah. Grief counselors, psychiatrists, therapists, everybody was making themselves available, right? Mm -hmm. To anyone who was mourning. So they had a lot of support. And one person, who I think was supplied by Merrill Lynch, which is who Bobby was working for at the time. Okay. This woman gave them a metaphor that was, uh, forgive the siren, we live in our hospital. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, gave them a metaphor that they found very useful, which was, imagine that you are at the top of a mountain, but you all have a broken leg. So this counselor said it to the three knuckle veins, uh, Bob Sr., Helen, and Jeff. Imagine you each have a broken leg. You all have to find your way down the mountain, but you can't rely on the other person because they've got a broken leg. Yeah. So you've got this thing that is incredibly painful and you have no one else to rely on because everyone else also has something incredibly painful, the yeah. same painful thing. And on the one hand, it's a great metaphor. And I think will help people feel less alone if they are feeling some kind of estrangement from those around them who are going through something similar and yet coping with it differently. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and I found this Super fascinating. I ran it by one of my favorite thinkers about grief, a woman named Roxanne Silver, um, who's at UC Irvine. And she said, she worked blue. I think she called the metaphor like, you know, horse hockey, but not that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and said, I, I don't like it. And she said, the reason I don't like it is that some people never get down the mountain. And it's, it's a fallacy to think that everyone gets down. Mm -hmm. And it's, in some ways, she didn't use these words, but her implication was, it's a tyranny to assume that people will get down. Mm. You can't expect some people to get down. They are gonna want to inhabit their grief for a very long time, possibly for the rest of their lives. For some people, their new reality, they might go on to have other joys in their life, but it will be bolted on to their grief. And that's Bob and Helen in a nutshell, right? I mean, you you write about Bob wanting to keep his grief close. In fact, your line, it was gorgeous. Roxanne, it, Roxanne Cohen, somebody's correcting me. Oh, thank God. Yes. Okay. 
<laughs> Wait, Roxanne Cohen? Oh, well, Roxanne Cohen Silver. It is Roxanne Cohen Silver. Sorry, okay. I was just looking. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I don't think you're being corrected. You're just being co context added. <laughs> That's fine. I can handle um, it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you said that if Bob Sr. chose to feed his grief, that Helen chose to starve hers. And I, I'm a mother, you're a mother. Um, I felt um, just such deep, profound empathy um, for Helen. I will never forget the line about Bob Sr. sleeping in his son's bed, um, waiting for the news. I wonder, um, you know, Bob Sr., you, you, you mentioned at the, at the start of our conversation, he believed it was an inside job. He didn't, I mean, it wasn't just sort of like, I believe it's an inside job. I mean, he has a whole, it was planned by the U S government to destroy the 23rd floor specifically, which is where the FBI was investigating the use of gold that the U S took from the Japanese during World War II. I mean, it's very, it's so a spoke theory. <laughs> yes. It's very what's that? bespoke. Yes. Yes. I wondered if you ever worried that his conspiracy theories would sort of diminish the empathy that people would feel for him or for his grief. I did. I did. And I, um, it's the only fight that I had with my editor, mm -hmm. um, not my edit, not my direct editor, but the editor in chief. He wanted me to land hard on the idea that conspiracy theories are dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, um, that's not the point here. The, the, I think everybody knows that they're dangerous. What they're doing here is serving Bob Sr. a purpose. Grief needs a villain. Mm. It's the, you know, and grief, I mean, for Bob, for Helen, Jen was the villain for, you know, that purloined diary, right? Um, for Bob, it was the government. Mm. And also, I think, respectfully to my editor, what I was trying to do there was to show that, well, he, it, there's no reason my editor would have understood this. I could not make this kind of psychological conjecture in a story in the Atlantic, but I can say it here. I, I think what Bob was doing, he embraced a theory that no one was gonna embrace with him. At least there are plenty of truthers out there, but the mainstream media was never gonna buy this and the majority of the American public was certainly not gonna buy this. So in embracing a theory that no one was gonna buy, Bob got the chance to talk about September 11th every day yeah. because he, could, he had to convince people, right? Yeah. right? If he had just accepted the actual truth of the matter, which is that 19 homicidal zealots hijacked some planes and killed a bunch of innocents, right? Um, you're done. That's not what you're talking about every day. But every day, Bob Sr. woke up and decided that September 11th was a cold case that needed to be solved. Mm -hmm. And in that way, he got to spend time thinking about Bobby and still parenting Bobby mm -hmm. and protecting Bobby and trying mm -hmm. to find justice for Bobby. It was a way to protract his parenting. And Helen, to her, to her unbelievable credit, because it took tolerating a lot of crazy talk, understood that and said to me, he is parenting Bobby in the only way he knows how. Like, this is what he has left, right? And to hear that was so unbelievably moving. And um, I also just sort of tried to point out all the ways that Bob was really super likable, um, Bob Sr. That, yeah. you know, he was the one who like, put up the tape around the house so that when they were running races, somebody got to run through the finish line and break a piece of tape. You know, um, Helen was really sporty when she was a young woman and Bob Sr. was the only one who would play sports with her on dates. Like yeah. most men thought that was very unladylike. Mm -hmm. And Bob was like, great, let's go skiing. You know, right. you, know? <laughs> you know, we contain multitudes. I would never have predicted that Bob Sr. would have been a person who would have um, decided that the U.S. government was behind 9-11, much less that it was behind 9-11 because it thought that something nefarious was going on on the 23rd floor having to do with the requisitioning of Japanese gold to bring down the Soviet Union, yeah. which was a conspiracy theory that he had 
kind of cobbled together. He had Humpty Dumpty from many different broken pieces of mm -hmm. things he was reading. Yeah. But he did. And Helen handles all of it with such grace toward him. Um, Certainly when she's speaking about him, she's ferociously protective. She's a mama bear. I don't know what their private conversations are like. I don't know if she ever looked at him and lost her temper and said, stop it. Mm -hmm. you know, I know that she had to work through it and that she had to say to him, we are going to a party tonight. Yeah. I'm going to be a victim and you are not going to talk about September 11th. And he would protest and say, well, what if people ask? And she said that she used to fall for it. And yeah. said, okay, fine. And that at some point she put her foot down and said, I don't care if people ask, you're going to deflect. Yeah which is kind of astonishing. I mean, at that point, maybe their legs were partially healed, you know, and they could stand on them both, yeah. you know, and, she, or she could put her own le healed leg down. I don't know. Maybe that's not right, but she, she insisted. She had enough, she knew enough about her own grieving process to know that this was not helping her and yeah. to ask, her, you know, which is interesting. Completely. I I also found myself so drawn to Bobby's younger brother um, and, and his, you know, his story and, and your, your telling of it raises so many questions about the surviving child, right? Does, you know, does he feel guilty when he's joyful? Does he feel extra pressure to feel joyful? Does he find himself siding with one parent or the other? So talk about him, talk about the brother a little bit and, and, and also your approach to him and what you decided needed to be told about him or what you should ask of him. So um, first of all, your journalism roots are showing us it's, it's, it's an unbelievably good question. And it's a really psychologically astute question to ask, did he feel consciously or not some kind of alliance with one parent over another? And I don't know if I even ever work up the nerve to flick at that. I did ask about his father. I don't know that you should have. I just found I myself wondering that, that right? I got in there with the other yeah. two. So it's a really interesting question. And also, was I hearing him answer it in any way? Because mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. you've just said is just, it's its almost electrifying. I mean, I'm now thinking about it. So let me start by saying, I wish that I had had more room to write about Jeff. By the time I got to Jeff, I was at the bottom of the staircase. I was at the end of the story. And I had tons of tape of Jeff. And the Atlantic podcast at the time, it was called The Experiment, did a whole podcast only about Jeff. They were like, this stuff is great. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was so moving. And it was about sibling grief. I got to do a little bit. I don't know if you can hear my husband sneezing. Sorry if you can. <laughs> so, <Okay>. Anyway, <laughs> he's like, right? like, it's like this open space. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, uh, Bob, so, so, okay, so let's discuss, discuss Jeff. First of all, he felt survivor's guilt, that, that terrible perdition of just being the surviving son, sure. Second, he told me something very moving, which is that he kept unbidden that scene from Stand By Me would come into his head mm. of the father, it's a dream sequence saying, it should have been you. Mm. Because Bobby was this, sui generis, self-invented, as I said, creature in his family. His parents went to state schools in Pennsylvania. You know, Bobby gets into Princeton. He's never even visited the campus and just gets in, you know, right. like he wasn't bred for the Ivy League or anything like that. He wasn't playing basketball against Kobe Bryant. I mean, like, I, I, he's selling. <laughs> and, and story, like, Kobe. Kobe. yeah. 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 No. And, and he didn't get into Princeton based on like his athleticism, by the way. Right. It was like yeah. the whole package. Right. And yeah, I mean, he was really smart. And so, um, and, but, but not like thinking that he was going to go to the Ivy league. He just like sent out his applications and was like, well, here goes nothing, you know? Um, and Jeff was, is like really bright and really funny and really related and really emotionally astute. High EQ wasn't much of a student went to you know a regular college like did fine but i think there was a part of him that thought oh my god the the, the guy who could have been the ceo of something or could have been the novelist or could have you know was the one who died and he definitely hinted at, at that more than hinted mm. um suffered a lot he also had an exceptionally mature insight 
for a 22 year old, which is how old he was when this happened, he, re he realized something almost immediately, which was, if I don't live a good life, Bobby's death will have, I mean, it, it would mortify Bobby. Yeah. I have to live a good life. This is the only way I can, this is the only path forward because it would, it would break Bobby to know that our whole family had never been able to function after. Mm. The best thing I can do to honor him is to, is to lead a good life. Yeah. So he did, you know, I mean, he, he, and it took him a while. He had some really low functioning years or not low functioning, hard years. He was never low functioning, but mm -hmm. some kind of slightly stalled years. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I'm trying to think of the things that he told me about those years. He wouldn't tell anyone his brother died on September 11th because mm -hmm. he got sick and tired of people saying, oh, I had a friend whose cousin was in the second tower, but then they were fine. And in the podcast, I didn't get a chance to quote this, but in the podcast, you hear him saying in his very arch way, okay. Yeah. Not exactly what happened in my family, yeah. but I'm glad it worked out. Happy for that. Family. Happy, you know, that you had a momentary scare and it went away or that some acquaintance of some tertiary human being that you know did. But, you know, he, he, he sort of had Helen's approach. He had to stuff everything inside and it set back his healing for years because you know, too much. This is a whole other kind of maybe random digression. It's not a digression. It's central. People say the wrong things to people who grieve, right? And it's oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking that as you're talking about Bobby Senior wanting at the party to talk about 9/11, it's like, well, he probably at the party wants to talk about his son, but no one says, "Tell me a story about your son." Right. You know, no one says, "What was you know what was what was Bobby Junior's favorite book?" Or I mean, the way we talk about people's children to them when their children are living. We're very bad at that once the children are no longer living. And so he's probably just like, okay, let me throw a conspiracy theory out there then. Cause they'll listen to that. Right. Well, it's, a proxy about that. For, it's a proxy for talking about your child. And you know, what's so funny that you just said that first of all, you're right. You're totally right. And second, um, the only person who asked, tell me about your son this day it makes my head explode rudy giuliani mm -hmm. we saw them in the armory on september 13th when they got the news when bobby's name was on a list and giuliani was just wandering around idly idly remember i mean yeah. new york was just filled with i mean all these zombies nobody knowing i mean everybody was in this awful state of limbo they didn't know about whether their loved ones were in hospitals whether they were conscious people hadn't quite grokked that everyone had really just been pulverized and that yeah. there were almost no bodies to be found. Mm. Bobby's body had, had been recovered and Giuliani was grateful to have something to do. Yeah. And actually sat down and said, tell me about your son, mm -hmm. which is such an, a high IQ, amazing thing mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. And it was the perfect thing to say. Mm -hmm. They just started talking. I mean, it's perfect. And we should all do that if we, I mean, tell me about your son. Tell yeah. me about your daughter. Tell me about your husband. Yes. Tell me about your mom. Yes. What were they like? Yeah. It's so basic. It's so basic. And somehow, we don't uh, do it. yeah, it goes against every instinct, I suppose. We've sort of talked uh, around the diary and, and, and touched on the diary, but um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the contents of the diary and what made it such, um, you know, a, a, a nuanced, complicated decision for Jen, rather than just a no brainer, of course, I should give it back to the mother, or of course, I should never give it back to the mother. Um, talk, talk a little bit about what was in the diary. I am a little reluctant just because I don't want to spoil it. That also yeah. comes from the staircase. So, yeah. and also it's, um, you can't believe it, right? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you feel like Bobby is speaking from the grave in more than one way. Um, I will say 
one thing. I mean, so I don't, so Janet, let me just put, I'll say a couple of things broadly. The diary makes it clear why Jen kept it. Like <laughs> once you read the diary, there's no ambiguity who it belonged to. It did not belong to Helen. Mm -hmm. It belonged to Jen. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly realize that a person who's not yet quite a fiance, who doesn't have a ring on her finger, much less is married or like has kids with someone. On the insurance, right. <laughs> right, yeah, right, whatever. Like, they right. have no status. They have no claims. And she really did have a claim to this thing. Yeah. Um, and why she was angry enough to hang on to it and not to, you know, transcribe those words that had to do with very particular dynamic that was going on between her and Helen, that guy and super fascinating that I'll also let people read. But um, I, I was interested in the diary for two reasons. I mean, I'm sorry, not only, I mean, first of all, grief is a subject in the diary. So like, that's fascinating. Like I wasn't expecting that. So Bobby has some wisdom to offer about grieving. That's the way that he's speaking from the grave. But the other thing is um, <laughs> the McElveins had as an organizing model for their grief, three words of Bobby's, life loves on. And they didn't remember where it came from. They had no idea. They just knew he had said it. And they were so sure he had said it that Bob Sr. has it tattooed on his bicep and Helen has it inscribed in a like um, in a bracelet that she never takes off. So they knew the words life loves on were somewhere. They didn't know where. And I hunted, I read every diary, every legal pad, every half-baked novel, every shopping list, every list of Bobby's gym reps. I read everything to try and find where Life Loves On came from. And when I finally found the phrase, so I'm just talking generally about written matter here, I discovered that um, it's not what he wrote. He wrote something else. Mm -hmm. And I had a heart attack. I just, uh, who wants to break that to the, I, I didn't know whether to tell the medical man. Because right. this had served so them so well for so many years. But when I got that diary, I found so many other beautiful, amazing things he said that I sort of felt like it didn't quite, it didn't really matter. There were better things than life loves on in that diary mm -hmm. and more profound things, much mm -hmm. more. So Helen gave me this opening, but I, I really had like a crisis. I mean, I, I called, I called my shrink. I called a friend who's a shrink. Yeah. I called a friend who's a rabbi in Texas. I called every moral authority I could think of. Yeah. And said, what would you do in this situation? And they were utterly divided. Like one said, don't do it. The other said, oh, yeah. do it. And then the other was totally on the fence. So like it was a wash. I had no clarity at all. Yeah. And then Helen gave me an opening in a conversation. Mm -hmm. How did writing this story shape your understanding your relationship to grief and 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 not just grief but love and allegiance and and loyalty and grace and all of the things that come up in the in especially in the marriage um but in all of the relationships okay so it's a great question okay so grief i was unaware that people chose never to get over their grief chose to inhabit their grief, chose grief as a way of life. Mm -hmm. Living in a glass house of sorrow became what they did. And not to judge it, to decide that that's as legitimate as any other way. Uh, if it's getting in the way of other people in your life, you obviously have to think through it. And obviously Bob and Helen had to work through it and figure out a way where this could be Bob's modus vivendi, where every day he could wake up and think about Bobby and grieve and cry. He cries every day, mm -hmm. but um, you can't judge that. And people do not mourn logically or sequentially or in stages. They might, but they also might not. And stages might hopscotch around and you might never make it to one stage and you might remain stuck in one stage. And you might, like, there's just, it's idiosyncratic. There's just no way. And you can have a spouse who's just doing it entirely differently from you. So. That was, 
it should be obvious, but it's actually not until it's kind of licking you in the face. I mean, you really don't, until it's at close range, you don't see this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, and you should never tell someone that it's time to move on. Mm. Yeah. It's their choice. I mean, that's a personal decision. Yeah. They're going to do it how they're going to do it. Um, in terms of love and grace, Helen said something to me about how she was for the first 10 years. And she said that how she was was not serving her well. Mm. She had to make a conscious choice to be different. And I'm always amazed by this, you know, like. Such self-possession. Yeah, it's an awareness and also grit. Like it's a certain yeah. kind of determination. Like she, she gets asked the question a lot, like, is, have you found, has there been meaning for you in Bobby's death? Mm -hmm. And it's like a hard question for her because like, said, is there meaning? I'd rather my son were here. Like, you know, meaning. Right. Right. Um, well, silver lining my son's death. Yeah. Like, and I think people want to console themselves with this thought. Right. Yeah. But what the way that she talks about it is by saying, you have to find meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there is meaning, but mm -hmm. it, it's not like it's going to be super apparent. You have to go out and look for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have found it, but it has taken, it's been highly effortful. Yeah. And a decade. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the kind of love that she has for her husband, that she, I, I mean, the most impressive thing that she did, I thought, was here's her husband spending every day talking about September 11th. She doesn't ever want to talk about September 11th, but on his 75th birthday, she, did this big collage of him talking to different journalists from, you know, different media outlets in different countries who were interested in his conspiracy theory ideas, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But she took pictures of, of him and she made a big collage. Mm -hmm. You know, she was like honoring his way of mourning. Wow. Wow. I know from following your work that you wrote um, not long ago in the Atlantic about um, enduring long COVID, um, a terrible case of long COVID. Absolutely. And I wonder if that is, um, if you're grieving the life you had before you got sick. I think about it all the time. I can't bear looking at the pictures on my, um, you know, I, the iPhone sort of sends up memories of, you know, pictures and I'm healthy in all of them. Mm. I'm healthy. I was healthy until I wasn't healthy. And now I'm just spectacularly unhealthy um, and taking seven medications and, you know, piecing my, I'm held together with duct tape, duct tape and bubble gum and twine. Um, and I, I'm in this asterisk percentile of people who seem to have gotten a permanent autoimmune disease out of it. Um, it's a post viral autoimmune disease. I, I mean, maybe it'll go away. Maybe my body will stop attacking itself. COVID is new, but, um, and I have other tedious vestibular issues that make life very, very challenging. Um, I grieve my health all the time and I don't want to put it in the same category as grieving a mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. but, you know, when you are not yourself and you feel estranged from yourself and you feel estranged from your previous self, mm -hmm. you are trying to, it is the same cataclysmic kind of disruption and rupture. Like you are not leading the same life. Mm -hmm. My life does not look the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't be the same person. I can't make dinner for my kid and go hiking with my kid. Maybe one day I will. Um, I can't be the kind of wife I want to be. I can't be any of the, the the things I want to be. I'm struggling valiantly to still be the kind of employee that I want to be because I need my insurance. Um, and because I'm very work identified, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm still trying to be the mom I can be by like lying on my kid's bed and, you know, reading with him and doing, you know, reading the same book he's reading in English. He's 15, you know, so reading Macbeth and reading Sula and reading the Odyssey, you know, but uh, it's hard. Um, and also I identify with Helen in this funny way and that no one says the right thing to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had so many people say to me, I feel sorry for you. Mm -hmm. 
I don't need anybody to tell me they feel sorry for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, not what I need. Mm-hmm. And it comes from a place of such good intentions that mm-hmm. I'm just trying to help. Mm-hmm. Um, I have people telling me, um, you know, this is tragic. This is heartbreaking. And I don't want to be seen as a tragic figure. This is why Helen did not go to her usual supermarket for 15 years. She yeah. didn't want people bursting into tears in front of her right. and telling her that her life was tragic. Right. She didn't, you know. Yeah. And then you're in the position of trying to cheer someone up about what you're going through. It, it, the awkward that reversal where it's the gr- the the grieving who is comforting the non grieving person or the well one right that's right so yeah I mean I, I would not want to look uh, my loved ones not wood they're all here they're with me and, but yes I'm grieving my health yeah thank you for being willing to talk about that. I think it feels important to talk about and also probably incredibly difficult. I, I want there to be the political will to figure this out. I have never, I never imagined I'd be sitting in front of so many doctors who would be telling me, we, I don't know. We don't know. You know. Even when people have cancer, they might not, doctors might be able to say they can't fix it, but they have some understanding of the trajectory of a disease. Yeah. A stage. Yeah. yeah. I mean, here nobody can tell me what's causing any of my symptoms. Mm-hmm. They, mm. they only have postulates. Yeah, incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Well, thank you for this conversation. Do you mind if we pivot to a few audience questions? Perfect. We have a few more minutes. Um, so I, I like this question. I'm curious. Um, Maureen says, I'm curious about Jennifer's reflections on how our culture and country deals with death in general. It seems there's a resistance to or maybe confusion about the process of grieving and especially all of the complex emotions. Yes. Well, I mean, we, we have um, Silicon Valley hard at work trying to figure out how to have all of us live forever. Right. This was just the latest episode of succession was all about that. Right. You know, uh, I think uh, we are uh, obsessed with our mortality, but really our immortality. And we don't have calm conversations about dying. Um, I can't remember what the percentage is of people who die having had chemotherapy that day or the day before, you know, like palliative care is not uh, um, something we do easily. We don't transition from fighting death to accepting death and trying simply to be comfortable as we move on from one parenthetical stage called life, right? And and there's a darkness before and a darkness after. So, um, I, I, you know, as a culture, I don't think that on the one hand, the bestseller list for a while had a lot of books about death. It had a tool, mm-hmm. you know, um, being mortal. It had, um, oh my God, why I can't remember. Why, why can't I remember the doctor who died? Um, he was 33 and uh, I want to say memory's last breath, but that was a. Oh yeah. I know what you're talking about. But it was, uh, it's something last breath. But anyway, it was um, somebody's going to figure it out and put it in the chat, I hope. Um, but the, the, there have been a number of good books about dying. Yeah. And they live simultaneously. So, on the one hand, we know that there's a pent up demand because a tools book lived on forever on the bestseller list in hardback and in paperback. It took a long time to transition into paperback. Everyone wanted to read that book. Um, so there is a pent up demand to want to think deeply about dying and to confront mm-hmm. it head on. And at the same time, we have this culture that can't abide the thought where we are Botoxing ourselves within an inch of our lives. And, you know, um, uh, every 50 is the new 30. No, it isn't. Not mm-hmm. from an actuarial point of view. Mm-hmm. 50 is, remains 50. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it remains the the sixth inning right, right. The that's half a century <laughs> it's actually an accomplishment <laughs> so right yeah. so I, mean, I, I don't really know how to sort of get around so i i think that um we are um in co- in deep conflict over this on the one hand we are trying there are um, corners that that are trying to uh, address this and i think covid made us think more about this. And there was a moment when palliative care doctors were quoted quite a lot. And we heard a lot about, you know, thinking about dying. 
then we had a president who was deeply resistant to the idea that anybody was dying at all. Mm -hmm. and didn't want to talk about numbers. And, mm -hmm. When breath becomes air is the name when of the When breath becomes air. Thank you. I said memory's last breath. I knew breath was in there. Breath. Yep. Yep. There was another one. Give the context, please. The, the widow. The, the, so the, the widower. Sorry. The widow of that book. Mm -hmm. I was dating for a while. The widower of another cancer memoir. That was oh, also a seller. Wow. Um, at the same time, I don't know if they're still together. I don't know if they got married. I don't know if they split. But I remember thinking it was a delightful bit of trivia. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a question um, submitted ahead of time. I haven't read your book yet, but plan to. I'm facing the painful loss of my mother because her identity is changing as her dementia progresses. I feel like I'm grieving now, but that maybe I shouldn't because she's still here. What do you think? Oh, don't judge yourself for grieving now. Allow yourself to grieve now. Uh, there should be no oughts, nothing normative here. Um, when I think about dementia, I think about Theseus's ship, you know, that paradox where is it his ship, if you replace one plank, an old plank with a new plank, mm -hmm. it's still his ship. But how many planks can you replace it with where it's still the same ship mm -hmm. or is it a different ship? Mm -hmm. And dementia, in a funny way, is that, but in reverse, you're, rep you're replacing old, old planks with even older, more rotted planks, you know, mm -hmm. and if each plank gets replaced with a rotted plank, at what point is your mother no longer your mother? Has she been mm -hmm. so denatured and so decanted of her identity and who she is? She doesn't know you or, you know, she, she doesn't know what she loves. There's a story about um, is it Robert Graves who wrote I Claudius? I think so. Mm -hmm. That sounds right. Um, when he had, was suffering from dementia, somebody mentioned I Claudius to him and he just was describing a particular plot point and he said, Oh, it sounds like a wonderful book. I, I should mm -hmm. like to read that book one day. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> this is kind of a beautiful question from Edward, and then we'll end. I see Lonnie on screen. Um, can you talk a little bit about your brother's grief journey after losing his dear friend and roommate of eight years? He tells me that to this day, he still doesn't know what happened, mm -hmm. you know, that he's still thinking about it, that it is still living with him. And was, that, and that at the time he really didn't know what he was going through, you know, that he was in such a fugue state. I mean, if it's your best friend, I mean, I asked him, did anybody ever sort of replace Bob for you? Because, you can't replace a son. You can maybe have another dear friend. Mm -hmm. And he said, the closest is my wife. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to marry that person. Um, but I don't know if he ever found a male friend that was Bobby's rival. Mm -hmm. And they spent every night in their adolescence for four years, yak yakking. Yeah. That's irreplaceable in a way. It burns its way. That's going to have a privileged place in your memory. Adolescence already has this outsized kind of yeah. state in your memory, right? Yeah, no, that shapes who you are. It shapes you. Mm -hmm. Heidi, I want to thank you for yet another beautiful interview on behalf of FAN. Jen, you are just, um, you know, never, never fails to just paragraphs that just sink in and are just so nuanced and so sensitive and just gorgeous. We just, we love you. We're so glad you're part of our family. Thank you so much for that. Yes, I want to remind folks, you can, um, you know, this is a, this is a slim volume. It's not a $30 hardbound book. It's a soft cover book. It's gorgeous. It's right up here on my shelf. Buy it, get it. It's important. This read, it's gorgeous. Um, we love it. I know that you're doing some speaking around the country. Um, groups are inviting you in and talking about this book. Uh, we are giving away copies tonight, but this is something, it's an easy gift for people to buy, pass out, um, give it to friends, give it to a, you know your group of all your girlfriends, whatever. So I just want to encourage folks to do that. Uh, just to, in case someone's wondering, is fan making money off those books? We are not. So <laughs> I'm not shilling for books or anything. And neither is Jen, I might add. Jen is also not making money off of this book, unlike <laughs> other books that might be published. But no, um, so you're I just want to say the Atlantic. You're supporting journalism. Exactly. We, we like that too. You know, we hosted, well, well, anyway, that's another topic. Well, Clint is coming, right? He's my colleague. I mean, yeah. yeah. That's right. 
I want to um, give a little bit of space to Sally McQuillan's question, which is, um, what do you think makes grieving a child different from other forms of grief? Oh, God. I mean, you can start with the basic thing, which is the irreplaceability, right? I mean, you can, and at a certain age, biologically, you can't even have other children. Um, but um, I mean, you may as well ask, I mean, uh, what makes oxygen different from yeah. carbon dioxide? I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's elementally different, I think in some fundamental way. Um, there is a, a hole in your heart that I don't think can be sewn up. You can have other friends and you can have other spouses. You cannot have another that, that singular other child, um, and all the time. That also, you know, children—it's gift love, right? They are people that you love no matter what, even if they are never going to love you back, mm -hmm. right? That you are just tunneling and pouring all of this love into them, knowing that one day they are going to leave you. It is a unique kind of love that is not predicated on any kind of reciprocity. It is not predicated on I. Idea that they must love you equally or even love you at all you know yeah. so to have all of that love and nowhere to put it when it is just spontaneously pouring out of you and not to even have an object for it yeah i wonder could i ask one more question um which is and it's a personal question so you can decline if you'd like but do you find it's changed how you are with your own son i wonder that too the story, the writing of the story, the diving into it, seeing those dynamics in particular? I hug them longer and harder, you know, um, but I think the truth is that fear is something that we keep nailed underneath a trap door. Um, I think George Valiant, the psychiatrist, said that grief is love inside out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, or joy inside out. Joy right? inside out. Yeah. And so if joy is a connection to somebody, if I've got this tremendous, like you've got to tolerate the kind of idea that you might lose that connection with another person, so, which makes joy in some ways harder to tolerate than sadness. So mm -hmm. I in some ways find the most joyous moments with my son now that much more excruciating because I can't bear the thought of not having them. Mm -hmm. I think this brought home, it was so close what that would feel like, I, that I find our joyful moments that much more terrifying, you know? And Brene Brown talks about this too. I think she calls it ominous, ominous joy. What is she, yeah. she's a phrase. It's a, but, it's a, it's a tinged, it has a tinge to it. Like you can't fully surrender to the joy because it has the creeping doom right behind it. Well, because you know, right, because right behind it is the terror that you might not have it anymore. I mean, you are so vulnerable in that joy. Right. It's, it's so unlike any other kind of feeling that you have that you can't bear the thought of it not being there. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's easier to be sad in a funny way. I do appreciate that you in here, we're on our final minute here. I do appreciate that you conjured up George Valiant, who is a friend of fan as well. Time spent amazing. with him uh, several years ago when he came and did events for us. He was what a, what an astounding human being. Uh, so deep. So deep. Oh, so very generous. I really love that man very much. Thanks for conjuring him up in my mind right now. That was that was a good feeling. Heidi, thank you so much. Um, you've done so much for fan. You've you bring so much nuance and sensitivity and love to your work. And we're very grateful every time you say yes to doing an interview. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks for asking. You know, you're you're never you're never far from us. So anytime you need us, please, we're always of service. Just let us know. And thank you, Heidi. This was amazing. Thank yeah. you for the company. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming.